This is the 82nd Airborne Division, fearless among fighting units. From Fort Bragg, home of the Airborne and the center of the military universe, this is the All-American Legacy Podcast. No! No! An inside look at the 100-year history of the 82nd. They are all American all the way. I am your host, James Walker, and welcome back to yet another episode of the All-American Legacy Podcast. The year 2017 marks our centennial, and all year long we've been honoring our century of service. Today we are going to take a look at the first of a two-part discussion about our 100-year legacy. This first part took place in October 2016 between Joe Puccino, the All-American Legacy Podcast host you know very well, and Kenneth Clark, the President and CEO of Pritzker Military Museum and Library. You may recognize Kenneth's voice as he has collaborated with us in previous podcasts, providing insight on the 82nd Airborne Division and our history. Please join me in welcoming to the Pritzker Military Museum and Library, Lieutenant Colonel Joe Buccino. Thanks. 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 Pleasure to be here. So for, po- for most people, the 82nd Airborne is an image of paratroopers who are going right. into D-Day, and they are the first wave in during the Normandy invasion. But a lot has happened uh, in the division's history that a lot of people maybe are not as up on, including the fact that it was formed during World War I. So can you tell me a little bit about what the division looked like back then? Yeah, absolutely. So in 1917, August 1917, the division looked like all of the other divisions that were formed for service into World War I. Uh, what's interesting, particularly interesting about the division is that it was started and formed in Camp Gordon, Georgia, and it was initially formed with soldiers and officers from the immediate area, really from Georgia. They, they really came from three states, Georgia, Tennessee, Alabama. And then, so it was kind of a very cohesive, you know, 22,000 man organization, all from kind of the same parts of the, parts of the country. And then in November, as the War Department identified kind of the demands of the war, the War Department started ripping thousands and thousands of these soldiers out of the 82nd to cede other divisions that had to be formed. So the uh, commander, General Evan Swift, was our first division commander. Drew started drawing recruits from all over the country, you know, initially from from the Northeast and then from all over the country, and realized at one point, uh, he realized and his staff, his chief of staff realized, they had representative from every state in the divi- in the country. They had a representative from every state in the country in the 82nd Division. So uh, we were always a representative of the American people, always the, the America's division, and that continues today. If, if you think about really the the real the real texture and, and the nature of the American experience over the last 100 years, all of that stuff is is kind of manifest in the history of the division. So it's a really cool you know, history that we have. And in many ways, the history is, is kind of blanketed by this you know, very romantic notion of a soldier you know, coming out of an airplane and, and fighting his enemy. And that's, that's obviously a great part of the American legacy, the American combat legacy. But that only goes back to you know, 74 years, in the last 74 years. And our history goes deeper than that. So you didn't have anybody jumping out of biplanes in World War I. So what were they doing in World War I? What they were doing in World War I was traditional, uh, you know, trench warfare, infantry tactics, infantry maneuvers. And it's, it's important to recognize and important to understand that the 82nd was a participant in all of the decisive moments of World War I, at least on the American side. So. Um, Use Argonne, we participated in Use Argonne and had a Medal of Honor winner from Use Argonne, Medal of Honor recipient, um, Alvin York, who was one of the most decorated soldiers in World War I. And then uh, before that, in the St. Mihiel Offensive, we participated. So we were a more of a uh, supporting effort in both of those, but we had the right flank in St. Mihiel, which was important, and supported the 90th Division, which was important. And our first all American hero. Uh, which is Lieutenant Colonel Emery Pike, came out of the St. Mihiel Offensive. So how is the, and this is broad picture because we're going to get into the details of sure. this later, but how has the, the role of the division really changed over that 100-year period? 
Sure. So um, what, what's not really understood is I think probably a lot of people are looking at this and saying, why are you talking about 100 years, 100 consecutive years, when really the 82nd was demobilized and disbanded after World War I? And that's not, that really is not true. The 82nd was demobilized. It was demobilized, but it wasn't disbanded. For two years, 1919 to 1921, the division did exist. It existed sort of on the books. So the War Department kept this structure, the division structure active. The 82nd remained on the, in the active army as a kind of structure in case we had to very rapidly fill the ranks of a division for another major theater war. And then in 1921, the division was reorganized into the National Guard as a drilling uh, drilling reserve unit in the Army Reserves, not the National Guard, as a drilling reserve, primarily stationed in South Carolina. The, head, the headquarters was in South Carolina, and the battalions and regiments were all over the South. Um, so that was maintained in the event that we had to very rapidly surge for something else. And then in 1942, of course, we were reorganized in Camp Claiborne, Louisiana, as the Airborne Division. So. 82nd Airborne Division, and then of course the great legacy in World War II, um, and then we've maintained that, that airborne status and that airborne role since then. So how did the American Industrial Revolution play into the forming of the division? Sure, in the same way that it, that it was manifest in the forming of a lot of these divisions, and, and you know, the, the American experience, American youth coming into these divisions, you know, really the, the 78th, 77th, 80th, 82nd, many of these divisions, and the 1st Infantry Division, at uh, the onset of World War One, you know that you know it was a a way for um, American youth, American male youth, to to experience a part of America and to really contribute to the country and contribute to the war effort. So, you know, the post-industrial revolution America has really been reflective of the of the eighty second experience ever since then. You know, and I think some of the things we may talk about with integration and uh, you know airborne operations. The Cold War, the evolution of threats, all that stuff is percolating under the surface of the history of our division. So it just informs pretty much everything. It informs pretty much everything. So you have this great history. You've got this bedrock of history that informs everything the division is doing, and it's right. tied into American history. So what is the current role of the 82nd Airborne right now? Right now, we have the Global Response Force mission, which is a readiness mission. We have an organization, part of our organization, that must be ready to send hundreds of paratroopers anywhere in the world to respond to a crisis within 18 hours. So they've got to be wheels up in 18 hours. And about 30%, roughly 30% of the division exists to support that role. And that's, you know, the folks that stay on the installation and outload those paratroopers, all of the enablers that go with, that may go with those paratroopers, all of that is manifest within the division, and it's a, it's a big effort, as you would imagine, just to maintain that readiness and maintain that alert and make sure they're ready to go. And then on top of that, we have all of the other things that a, all of the other divisions in the Army have to do, which is resourcing the organizations to go to Iraq, Afghanistan. Right now, we have a, a cavalry squadron and air squadron in uh, Korea. Um, we have missions in, in Europe. We have multinational partners. So we have all of the traditional things, all the traditional sourcing elements that, a, that a, all the other divisions have to do. So we combine those two and it's, uh, it makes for a very high level of readiness, but a lot of these things kind of you know, consume readiness. So we're constantly training. We're constantly on the cycle of coming back from something and then preparing to go somewhere. So for people who aren't um, entirely up on what it takes to be ready like that, how would you describe that to somebody? The, the, um, the impact on the soldiers, the uh, impact on the infrastructure, the, you got the kind of the teeth and the tail aspect of the division. How would you describe that? Uh, it is, I've never seen it before because I've never been in the division before, and it is, as you would imagine, it is quite an effort to, first of all, on the paratroopers that have to be ready to go. They have to be, they, they can only leave they can go within a certain area, distance mileage from Fort Bragg. They've got to be, there are certain days they cannot go anywhere. They've got to be ready to go if they get the call within a, you know X number of hours. And then you have all of the other support systems. And so, you know, you've got the, uh, the folks that pack the parachutes. You've got our sustainment brigade. 
that uh, out that does all the outload. You've got another brigade that stands up to to kind of push the, the brigade that's going out the door, and then we've got our uh, kind of joint coordination. So we're we're in constant coordination with Air Mobility Command, the Air Force, to be ready to execute something th that could be very large. Now it could also be you know along the spectrum of things, we could respond to kind of low intensity, which would be humanitarian relief all the way along the spectrum of, of, I guess, human crisis or strife, you know, human strife all the way up to high intensity conflict. So that's a, an awful lot to be prepared to do. So it requires a really cerebral type of leader, a very, you know, kind of flexible and intellectual flexibility on the, the leaders in that organization, really kind of at the company, company grade and above. And even any company grade and below, so it's a, it's an awful lot to, to ask of an organization. But we have some great leaders, and we have some really disciplined paratroopers. We're going to get into this a little bit, but it strikes me that anybody who served in the 82nd or even associated with it, it's, there's a lot of pride there, and I think part of that pride is that readiness. Would you agree with that? Yeah, absolutely right. Yeah, there, there's a lot of pride there. The pride is tied to some other things. The history, the pride, pride is in many ways tied to the history, but it is tied to the fact that we have this really unique. Um, really important and really unique mission. All the other divisions have, a, have an important, you know, have an important mission. So they're all important, and and we don't oversell that. We don't beat our chests about it, but it is something that we are very cognizant of. That we are ready to go tonight. We're ready to jump, fight, win tonight. Tonight, eighteen hours. <laughs> you uh, you. Uh Talk about the context of getting that many people out the door in 18 hours. That speaks to a level of readiness that I'm not sure a lot of people are thinking about our American military being that capable. Mm -hmm. um, you hear a lot about, um, you know, we have things that are too big, too large, too slow, but right. the 82nd Airborne kind of is right in the face of that notion. So we are fast, we're expeditionary, we're mobile. We are, uh, you know, we're small, so so we're lean. We we don't do big trucks. We have small things. We have things that are that are mobile that can move quickly, things that can be airdropped and then can move to an objective. So we've got to be able to to provide. You know, we've got to be able to provide options to the national capital region. So we've got to be able to go somewhere where there is not an airfield that's working or that has an airfield that is contested or, or being held by somebody we don't want to hold it. Um, we've got to be able to go somewhere and then move to an airfield and then open up a lodgement for follow-on forces. So that requires us to be small, flexible, agile, and really, we say, innovate to dominate. So we're constantly innovating. We're constantly on the knife's edge of technological advancement and also all kinds of other advancement, just the way we take care of our paratroopers, the way we prepare for operations. We're constantly innovating and constantly just thinking of ways to improve. You know, we're an evolving learning organization, and so we're just looking at constant ways to improve the way we do everything. So what is the broad picture of what the 82nd is doing right now? Right now, so we have, like I said, about 30% of, of our organization exists to support the Global Response Force, and then we've got a uh, brigade, one brigade we just announced um, is, is going to support, uh, you know, the, the continuing efforts here in Iraq or Afghanistan. We've got a, a, an element that's in Korea, and then we've got another that is potentially going to go in the pipeline for either Iraq or Afghanistan. So we've got, as, as our brigades come off of the Global Response Force mission, they go to other missions because they come out at a very high level of readiness. They're ready to go do something else. So they maintain the Global Response Force mission, then they hand it off to another brigade, and then they're at a very high level of readiness. So generally, they're ready to be sent somewhere to one of these ongoing missions somewhere in the world. So uh, can you talk about any recent operations that have happened that we may not know about or? Sure, so in the, this past spring, we did something that was very large and scope, very complicated. We did a multinational airborne insertion into Poland. And it was a, the, the scope of this thing is, I'll, I'll just explain the scope of it, is that we went from uh, Fort Bragg to Poland. Now this is all planned, this wasn't a, a, an alert, but we went from uh, Fort Bragg to Poland without touching down. We refueled over the air, we rigged our equipment over the air, over the Atlantic, and then um, the in-flight refuel, and then jumped into Poland. And, while, and in Poland, we met partners from uh, Polish airborne partners, 
British airborne partners. There were six countries that were involved in this. Six countries, four points of origin, and three drop zones. And thousands and thousands of paratroopers involved in this. And then when we got on the ground, if that's not exhausting enough, when we got on the ground, we did a pretty complicated mission. So it's important to remember that the airborne insertion is... Like I said, it's, it, it's something that captures the imagination. It's a romantic notion, but it's just a means to get to the fight. Once we get to the drop zone, once we land, we've got to do the, we've got to get to the objective and we've got to do the mission that we're there to do. Um, one other thing we did this past summer is we alerted the Global Response Battalion, which is part of our first brigade, the Devil Brigade, and they, they did a no notice alert. This was directed by Forcecom, Forces, US Forces Command. Um, they did a no notice alert and about a hundred hours later they jumped into uh, JRTC, into Fort Polk. They got into JRTC and they did a, an operation, low intensity conflict operation with world class opposition forces at JRTC. But we did all that with no prior notification. So you just did it? We just did it and uh, you know, tested, tested the readiness. So General Abrams, Forces Command, tested our readiness and we, we met the test. We were able to get everybody out the door, we conducted the operation, and it was a great, you, know, you see things, the, the leaders in that organization had an opportunity to see things they would never really see that they need to resolve or things they can improve on, things they can evolve, they would never really see had we not done something that really kind of dramatic. It's very interesting, we hear a lot about how the military is not ready, or we're not up to this, or we're not up to that, and we're in decline and all that kind mm -hmm. of stuff because of, you know, budgetary stuff. But it sounds like, uh, at least to the people I talk to, that's just not the case. We're meeting the mission no matter what. Right. You Challenge. Know, I, sure. I mean, I can only speak for right. the 82nd yeah. Airborne Division. Um, I know that, uh, you know, there, there are budgetary constraints uh, all over the Army that, that general officers talk about. I know within the 82nd Airborne Division, we have a, ver a hugely complex mission. And on top of that complex mission, we have to do all the other things that all the other divisions have to do. But, you know, we have some great leaders, we have some great paratroopers, and, you know, we should say that, I should say that, I know 1st Infantry Division came through here. The other divisions have great people also. So, you know, we're, we, don't, we don't put ourselves above all the other divisions. So there are a lot of good people in our Army. I personally think that that should give the American people some great confidence in our Army, um, especially if we talk about what a soldier needs to do to become part of the 82nd Airborne Division. That's just, you don't just get to sh sign up and go jump, right? That is true. We say that uh, our, our paratroopers are three times volunteers. So they volunteer to join the Army in a time of war. They volunteered to go to airborne school. And then they volunteered to serve in an airborne unit. And so they are, they're three times volunteers. What we do in terms of airborne operations is inherently dangerous. That doesn't mean they're unsafe because we are very well trained, but there is an element of danger when, when you do any kind of training, any kind of army training that's complicated, there is danger. But when you add altitude, when you add speed, when you add you know, a, a combination of, of the Air Force and the Army and talking from the ground to the air, you add some layers of complication and so there is something dangerous about that. And so our paratroopers know that, they understand that and yet they volunteer to serve in the 82nd Airborne Division. Let's get into some of the things that somebody in the 82nd has to do. I've heard people talk about having to jump every 90 days, mm -hmm. at least, in order to maintain um, readiness. What are some of the other things that somebody has to do to be in the division and be an active part if you're you know, somebody jumping out of planes and or supporting that? Right, so if you are somebody jumping out of planes, you do have to jump every 90 days to maintain your airborne status. So that is your airborne currency. Proficiency is, takes more than that. To be proficient in airborne operations, we say that you've got to do it every 30 days to just, to get, just to get very proficient at the whole process. Um, and then the, the folks that support that have to, the, the folks that support our, our Global Response Force mission and our, and our readiness battalion, are they have to be on constant alert. Um, and then you've got you know, the, the parachute riggers who we, when we do airborne operations, we place our lives in their hands. You know, E5s, E6s, specialists, um, junior enlisted folks that put the parachutes together, that pack our parachutes, and that is a constant process, making sure that we have enough chutes to maintain airborne proficiency and airborne currency. 
So um, you mentioned this earlier, but the, the jump is only a way to get to the fight. So um, I think that many of us have this idea of the, um, the uh, paratrooper M1 that was carried into World War II. Uh, the equipment that the paratrooper is using today is still, it's, a, it's, a, it's specially for them, correct? The, the equipment that our paratroopers jump with is specifically designed to be airdroppable and to be parachuted in. So we have specific vehicle platforms, mobility platforms, weapon systems that can be air dropped in. Some of our equipment is dropped without the, para, without the paratrooper, so it's dropped on its own parachutes and on a pallet, and then some of the equipment is dropped on the soldier, so when he lands on the, it's the landing zone, he is ready to fight with the equipment that he jumped in with. Uh, is there innovation amongst uh, those in the 82nd on exactly the kind of equipment that they need and want and desire and what they're jumping with, certain pockets or, you know, things like that? That is, is that part of the culture of the 82nd? It, it is, it is. So, and that's one of the, when we say innovate to dominate, that's one of the things that we're always looking at. You know, the, the most efficient way to get the paratrooper to the fight with all his equipment ready to go. So he gets to the, to the drop zone and he's, he's immediately ready to fight. Um, so that is one of the things that we're always looking at. We've got our, our brigades that, that do this all the time, that are very good at it. And our readiness battalion, our readiness brigade, they have specific standards of operations and standard procedures to, to kind of formalize that whole process. So they're bringing in new stuff all the time. Bringing in new stuff all the time. Stuff. Thinking, about, thinking about new stuff all the time. So our, we have a new, when you have a new commanding general, uh, general, Major General Eric Carrillo, who's about five weeks into his command, and he has a very, he spent a lot of time um, in uh, the special operations community, and he has a very strategic view of, of technology, weapon systems, and then everything else, standards, policies, procedures, you know, what's the most efficient way to do this? What's the most efficient way to be ready to fight tonight, even if it's something we haven't done before? You kind of got my next question. You just said it. I, everything about the 82nd and what you're capable of doing does sound <coughs> almost like a special operation unit. You know, you hear about the SEALs and the Rangers and all mm -hmm. that stuff, but then you have the 82nd. This is an Army division it's an Army that division. is doing this. This is not a special operations unit. This is a division. And it's, that's it's kind of different, and it's at a scale that is so much larger. Um, right. So, right. So what we potentially can, can offer that is not necessarily manifest in the special operations community is we can bring in a larger package. So we can secure a, a, a lodgement, mm -hmm. we can secure an airfield, we can secure something, and then bring in a much larger package and we can sustain ourselves potentially over a longer period of time than our special operations brothers and sisters may necessarily not be able to do. So it's a, it's kind of an added capability. But yes, it's a, within the division, within a division that large, to have that airborne capability, it really does give our country many options. It adds flexibility, it adds different ways to consider responding to a crisis. So let's go back, uh, let's go back into history a little bit and sure. talk about the division. Um, what is the deal with the All-American Division nickname? Where did that come from? It, somebody made this up, right? Somebody made that up. Uh, so the, 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 it's, a, it's, inter it's a very interesting story. Let me just start over. Sorry. It's a very interesting story. The, our first commander, we say the first All-American Six, was Major General Eben Swift. And like I said, he looked across his formation and realized that he had soldiers from all 50 states. And so the, the way the story is generally told, and even paratroopers that come into our division are told this story, is that Eben Swift held a formation. He started talking to soldiers. Where are you from? Where are you from? And he realized he had soldiers from all states. And he said, well, we're the All-American Division. And that is not true. What, uh, what really happened with this was General Swift realized he had soldiers from all 50 states. And he said, we are America's division, so we're going to allow the country to name its division. So he had a contest. And uh, he had a very public contest where folks could uh, submit names for the division. And so the, there is one woman, Vivian Goodwin, in Atlanta, Georgia. She is, I consider her to be the mother of the 82nd. She submitted the name All-American. And so there were hundreds of names that were submitted. She had the winning name. The All-American Division is, is a nickname that really stuck. It's mm -hmm. really something that you guys uh, identify with. But Absolutely. from yeah. what I understand, there were some names that didn't really make the cut. Yeah, there were some weird names, and uh, the Atlanta Georgian fortunately captured all this in, in 1917. But there were some weird names. Um, 
that we are glad did not make the cut. One of them was, for example, the singing division, which uh, doesn't exactly strike fear into the hearts of our enemies. Um, although, although Evan Swift, Major General Evan Swift, had, had an almost like obsessive focus on singing. I guess he felt it built, it built unit cohesion, but he was really focused on com- at the company level, at the unit level singing. But, so the singing division was one of them. Uh, United States Buddies was one of them. Now, that sounds like a very friendly organization. It sounds like something you and I would want to be part of. Yeah. But it doesn't sound like something that's ready to jump out of the sky and kill our nation's enemies. Buddies are coming. Oh, Buddies. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, some of them were very spe- specific to our, uh, our German you know, enemies in World War I, like the Hun haters is one, Kaiser catchers, Catcher is spelled with a K intentionally. And then many variants on that. So well, now one of them, I, I, didn't, I don't know where they were going with this, but one of them was Mother's Pet. That was one of the names. Okay. So glad that one was rejected. Yeah, but. I don't think you would all be banding around Mother's Pet <laughs> as a division name. Right. Um, what about the, uh, the AA patch that we see that is associated with the division? The AA patch is an outgrowth. And now the AA patch actually wasn't really developed until the unit started going into World War I. So actually, and they were already in England, um, but around, so in 1918. But the AA patch is obviously all American. It has the United States colors. And so the design was developed by uh, General Swift and by his chief of staff. So um, are there other nicknames now that uh, have kind of come and gone with uh, you know, past conflicts or recent conflicts that have been kind of traded around? Well, we've stuck with uh, All American. We yeah. also say that we're America's Guard of Honor. That's an outgrowth out of our World War II legacy. Um, but All Americans has, has really stuck. Um, so, you know, one thing that's kind of has come and gone is our motto all the way is our motto. And so that's another kind of myth is that people think that that was a, a, a result of All the Way to Berlin, which is the name of Lieutenant Colonel uh, James Magellis' book, All the Way to Berlin, that we kind of went, we started in, in the campaign in World War II in the European theater and then went all the way to Berlin. And that is not true. Our actual motto is inland on air. For some reason, we don't use it. Uh, after World War II, we started using the 509th motto, which was all the way, and that stuck as our sort of motto. Got it. What are some, uh, what are some of the, every, it seems like every division has a tradition or a set of traditions, right. and what are some of those traditions that have come out of World War I uh, and also the 100-year history of, of the division? Sure. So one of our traditions is All-American Week. That's something that uh, many of our alumni plan their year around All American Week. It's a, it is a big event. It's a week long sort of a a series of competitions and uh, opportunities to demonstrate our airborne proficiency. And so it culminates with a, a review, just like any other division review, except of course, it is an airborne review. So we send most of the division, you know, thousands of paratroopers jump onto our parade field or in Sicily drop zone and then they do they do a march and so this last year was the first time I'd seen it we had uh, artillery shooting in support we had uh, M razors which is a small mobile platform we had a full scale operation and on the back end of that was our airborne review so the parade with our commanding general in the lead and it was a very dramatic thing and and it was a really cool thing to see, and a lot of our alumni and who were there for World War II and all the Cold War deployments really appreciated it. So it's, it's a great time to recognize the legacy and those who came before us, and it's also a great time to recognize our great paratroopers. So the, uh, the 82nd got over to World War I. They got there by boat, obviously. Got there by boat. You know, everybody yeah. got over there by boat. Right. And that's one thing people kind of forget about with World War I, that sure. everybody, the Navy basically got everybody there. Right. And uh, more people than ever had gone across the Atlantic Ocean to fight a war ever in history. Um, sailed for France, and um, there's the story about passing a review for George V. Um, right, so, so we sailed initially in April 19 to Liverpool, England. And then we came from Camp Upton, New York, Camp Upton, New York, to Liverpool, England, and then from there into France our division headquarters and the 325th Regiment went through London. And there in London, they did this pass and review. They did a formal 
marching in front of the king and the queen. And so it was a great kind of lineage and honor. And he wrote a, he wrote a letter to all of our paratroopers. And so they weren't paratroopers, I'm sorry. He wrote a letter to all of our soldiers. He wrote a letter to the division. And so it was a great uh, kind of honor and lineage that we developed that day. What is in that letter? Uh, soldiers of the United States, the people of the British Isles welcome you on your way to take your stand beside the armies of many nations now fighting in the old world, the great battle for human freedom. The Allies will gain new heart and spirit in your company. I wish that I could shake the hand of each one of you and bid you Godspeed on your mission. So that's April 1918 from King George. So they were over there for uh, a longer consecutive time than any other division, is that correct? They were. So they were there for a longer consecutive time, and they were initially in a defensive posture, They were, and then they went to the Marbeche sector, where they really were in, in more of a supporting role. And then, of course, St. Mihel, they had a supporting role, but it was a critical role. We had the right flank in St. Mihel and supported the 90th Division. And then on September 15th, 1918, was the day that our first all-American hero, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Emery Pike, had a very uh, gallant action. He, he kind of organized 20 soldiers during a, a, um, during a time when we were di very disorganized and, and getting beaten back by the Germans. He organized 20 soldiers to continue the offensive, was mortally wounded, and continued command and control in the fight. And so... That was our first hero, and then Meuse Argonne followed on that. We had a more supporting role in Meuse Argonne, and then, of course, Sergeant Alvin York was our second All-American hero, our legend, uh, from, that, from that fight. So we have today uh, Pike Field on uh, Fort Bragg, stands in memory of Lieutenant Colonel Emery Pike, and, of course, we've got uh, a building and many plaques dedicated to Alvin York. Unfortunately, if you, if you, well, I don't know if it's fortunate or unfortunate, but if you travel around Fort Bragg, around the 82nd footprint, so much of it is dedicated to our, our airborne legacy that I feel in some ways our, our World War I legacy is overshadowed, and understandably so, overshadowed by our airborne legacy. Well, World War II uh, captured everybody's attention uh, in a way that World War I did, but it just they were separated by some decades. We had, a, we had an author come through here, and he said, well, the, really the only big difference between World War I and World War II, um, in some ways, I guess we could add, there was no airborne in World War I, right. and there weren't any nuclear weapons in World War I. But really, it was the same fight in the same place with the same players almost, and, and, and a battle for control in that particular area of the world. So um, I think that doing a talk like this is important because we can bring some of that World War I history back into the forefront and talk about those things. Um, one of our goals through doing stuff like this with you and with the World War I centennial is the idea to get the idea that the Musargon Offensive, that, that epic battle that is mm -hmm. bigger than any battle in American history, um, is something that we should have at the same level as D-Day or Gettysburg or, you know, Yorktown or um, Battle of Trenton or things like that. Um, what are your thoughts on what the 82nd's doing along those lines to, to think about that beyond a conversation like this? So for the 100 year, for the centennial, we are going back beyond World War II and we're doing something that is pretty cool. We're doing the All American Legacy podcast, which will start in January, January 17th. And so the All American Legacy podcast is the full centennial. We've got three episodes that focus on World War I. One of them focuses entirely on St. Mihel. So telling those stories is something that, um, that is really critical to us in our centennial. And then we're doing another thing that is going to be 100 stories, 100 minutes, 100 days. And we're going to start, you know, start at the very beginning and go through certainly St. Mihel, Meuse Argonne, Alvin York, and then there are some other really cool stories in there about World War I. So just telling those stories is something that's really important to us. World War I definitely informed the, the creation of the division. World War II is really where you earned your reputation. Right. And, and D-Day really did that. What are some of those moments that you think, in, in your opinion, and then also from the division's opinion, that were the defining moments for uh, the 82nd? Sure. Well, the combat jump into St. Mary Glees is one of the defining moments in world history. And we were obviously that that's very important to us. So, the, you know, the combat jumps, those things are, are very important. The heroes, the legends that came out of that, those things are very important. And so 
I say that when you serve, when you wear the double A patch and you wear the maroon beret, you live among the ghosts of legends. And so as you drive around Fort Bragg, many of our streets are named after a World War II legacy. Many of the buildings are named after these heroes. As you go into our buildings, you see all of the major personalities, all the major heroes, you know, uh, Gavin, Magellis, we've got uh, a competition named after Magellis, Ridgeway, all of the, the kind of the leaders that, that shaped world history in many ways. So we pay great tribute to them, pay great homage to them. So you have the jump into France, but is, are there other jumps during World War II that people should know about? There are other jumps. We had the, the jumps into uh, Italy. We had, we had those, the, the combat operations in Italy, the first one that, uh, you know, first combat operation led by General Gavin, which was uh, very problematic, was kind of overcome by um, a, a, an error with, with um, basically an error with the, with the aircraft, uh, confusion, kind of the fog of war type stuff, and then high winds. So, you know, airborne operations then, the, the kind of the infancy of, of airborne combat operations were uh, very, very risky, and so very complicated to do to put paratroopers on the ground in that manner. And so we, we obviously took the lessons learned, our, our, our leaders took the lessons learned from that specific operation, applied them to future operations. Um, and then we have some other um, kind of interesting stories like um, Operation Giant 2, which was the jump into Rome, uh, two airfields in Rome, which was canceled um, by General, uh, General Taylor. General Taylor was kind of skirted into Rome under a hidden guise. He was skirted into Rome in an, in an ambulance, hidden as a prisoner of war to um, kind of prepare for this airborne operation for the seizure of Rome. And then about 15 hours before the jump, he canceled it. He just felt that the German defenses were too developed and that the Italian forces weren't quite ready to do this. He canceled it. He sent the cable to North Africa. And seven hours before launch, it was decoded and the mission was canceled. And then there was obviously some other complications with, with General Eisenhower was you know, perturbed and there was kind of a back and forth. But it's another cool story from our history that, that is not uh, as well known as St. Mary's yeah. Lease or the other jumps. What are some of the other points in, in your history that are not as well known as World War II that have happened after the war? So we had uh, many Cold War deployments. One of the ones that um, we talk about was Operation Power Pack in 1965 our response to the Dominican Civil War, the Civil War in the Dominican Republic. That was a strictly 82nd Airborne Division and some enablers from Fort Bragg, but we were the only division that participated in that. And that's, we lost nine paratroopers in that mission, but it's really, it's kind of been swept aside by Vietnam. And so that's a great story, though. It's a it's a uh, very compelling story. It's one that we are going to tell in the All American Legacy podcast. And then, of course, we've got all of the uh, kind of the, the Cold War airborne operations that we did uh, subsequent to that. And you do relief efforts as well. We do relief efforts. So we had uh, the Hurricane Katrina relief, uh, disaster relief in Hurricane Katrina, disaster relief in Haiti. So so we have because we have the ability to to you know agile, mobile, fast, because we have the ability to do that, because we're small and fast, we can get soldiers in to do those kind of missions, kind of non-standard missions. So the U.S. military seems to always be on the forward edge of social change. You're always incorporating things long before society does as well. Um, the triple nickel is an example of this. Absolutely. And, yeah. and can you talk to us a little bit about the, the triple nickel, where they come <laughs> from, how they were incorporated in the 82nd? Yep, so the Triple Nickel was the 555th Parachute Infantry Battalion. It was the first all-black parachutist battalion developed for entry into World War II. The Triple Nickel never served overseas in the fight in World War II, largely because they could not fill a full battalion um, because there weren't enough kind of recruits to do this. But uh, they did serve on the west coast of the United States in uh, during the war. So. During the war, the Japanese uh, Imperial Army sent thousands and thousands, about 9,000 fire balloons, which sounds kind of odd, but it was fire balloons with incendiary devices that would, um, that would ignite, you know, s set to detonate over forests on the West Coast. And so the idea was that it would be, it would cause chaos, it would, it would cause a drop in morale, and it would cause the American public to not support the war effort. And so, the triple nickel 
did smoke jumps. So they, they jumped into these forests and put these fires out. It's not really clear how many of these incendiary devices made it to the West Coast, but we know that some did. So they served that mission. And um, they served that mission. And then after World War II, they were incorporated into the 82nd Airborne Division, making us the first integrated division. That's great. Um, you also have current history happening um, this current year, right? Current history happening this year. Right now. So, right now. So we have the, the first female infantry officers in the Army are incorporated into the division that is happening right now. And so that is something, it's kind of a, as big a deal as we make of it, and, and it's, it's not particularly a big deal in terms of our ability to operate and, and what it means today, right now, in the fight, readiness. Um, but yes, that is part of, uh, you know, part of our continuing legacy of representing the broad American experience over the last 100 years. That's great. Um, how aware are the 82nd Airborne Division members of their history, of their lineage, of where they come from? Very, very aware you cannot escape it. You cannot escape it if you serve in the 82nd. So from private to general, you've got a... From private to general, we've got, you know, uh, our, our, the, like I said, the names of the buildings, the names of the, the streets within, and it's, it's even more focused down at the regiment. You know, our, our regiments align very closely with the World War II history. Our commanders do terrain walks in some of those parts of the country where we did these operations. And we also maintain uh, relationships with our NATO allies, with our militaries that we served alongside in World War II. We do jump exchanges with, the, with those units where we share their uh, airborne wings. We, they share ours. We, we jump out of the same aircraft. So you really cannot, you really cannot ex escape it in the 82nd Airborne Division. Who are some of these legends of history that we've been talking about with the 82nd Airborne Division? Sure. So one name that comes to mind is Lieutenant Colonel James Mangelis, who served, he's one of our m most highly dedicated, he's one of the most highly dedicated officers in our history, Distinguished Service Cross from World War II, and um, he's still very tied to the division. We have a, uh, a competition, best lieutenant competition after him, and he in fact visited our paratroopers in Afghanistan a few years ago. He is 99 years old at this point, and in Wisconsin, we sent one of our deputy commanding generals for the 82nd to a, a post office that was named in his honor, renamed in his honor. Um, and so he is still a very celebrated figure in our history. Uh, people join certain units because of their background and what they've done. And they want to be part of something that has accomplished something. Now, when you, when you go to the paratroopers and you were in 82nd, one of the things that brings you there is the fact the 82nd was the first, the first airborne unit uh, to be formed, and then they were the first American uh, division uh, on enemy soil, and that they have a compiled a, a, a record of combat uh, through 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 the entire war, and that they have set the standards for for leadership and set the standards for everything else. And so that if you're if you're gonna if you're gonna get in service and you wanna be with a, an outfit that has accomplished something and you can take pride in it, you're gonna look at the eighty second because they've they've got a record unequaled in terms of history, in terms of accomplishments and everything else. Who else should we know about? Oh, you should know about, uh, obviously, Alvin York. We spoke about Alvin York, and, and uh, Colonel Retired Gerald York maintains the Alvin York Society. Um, still, uh, that, that, that name and that lineage, and also what he meant to his family and to the country after the war um, is a really interesting story as well. Um, Al Rivera, if you get a chance. Uh, Al, so Al Rivera served in uh, the Dominican Republic, Operation Power Pack. He is um, an all-American story in the sense that he was raised in Cuba. He had to leave Cuba to escape Castro, made his way to the United States, and then joined the 82nd. Didn't quite know what it was, but he talked, you know, kind of talked to a recruiter, joined the 82nd, and then he served as a rifleman, and he also served as a pseudo-linguist mm -hmm. in the Dominican Republic and in the kind of the house-to-house -house pseudo counterinsurgency type operations there. Uh, what I learned in the 82nd, that influenced my professional career and my life always to the point 
that when I retire in November 2012, uh, within three months of my retirement, I wrote on one page the 10 things that a young person needs to do to get ahead in American corporate life. The 10 things that I have there, many of them came from my days in the 82nd because I was learning from all the officers and I will observe how they will make decisions, you know. And one thing that we always did in the 82nd, uh, for, we did maneuvers in Fort Bragg or we did a, a mission in the Dominican Republic. We always look back and to see what could have we done better. There's two questions that are, you know, there's actually I have three questions that I think are quite important for us wrapping up this uh, conversation and thank you for doing this with us. It's really cool that you guys you came all the way out here to do this. No, thanks for the opportunity. Yeah. Um, so, what is next for the 82nd Airborne Division? What's next for the 82nd Airborne Division as we continue here under Major General Eric Kurilis' command? He's about five weeks into the command. Is continuing to keep the 82nd at the knife's edge of readiness. So we keep the bayonet sharp. We obviously maintain readiness, but. General Carrilla has the staff, has his staff and his leaders looking at ways to continue to evolve everything we do, continue, you know, ways to talk from aircraft to ground, to talk from the ground to another airfield, real time, to do uh, real time command and control on an aircraft, to, you know, combat planning on an aircraft, and then everything from the way that we get ready to do airborne operations, the way that we prepare. How do we? reduce the number of injuries from airborne operations? How do we reduce the, the physical stress of wearing the equipment and wearing the chute and all your equipment standing up in the door, the airborne timeline? How do we evolve ways to bring our families into, into our readiness platforms, bring the community into our readiness platforms? We're, we're looking, he's looking at, he has us looking at all of that stuff. And so we're constantly trying to innovate ways of, of, of thinking and doing things in the 82nd. So, Given everything you just said, <clears throat> mm -hmm. um, how do people talk about their, their being a part of the 82nd? Um, why is it important? What's, what's the spirit of it? What's the, I, I, what's the crux of the uh, experience that you have? Sure. So the way that um, I think about this, like I said, airborne operations are inherently dangerous. And we know and appreciate that. And so the, the, the story that I tell my daughter is that when you're standing up in the aircraft, you, you get the command to stand up and hook up. You're standing up in the aircraft. I, I always look around at the faces of the other paratroopers because it, it kind of calms me. And you've got a lot of energy in the aircraft. You've got some people are nervous, some people who've done it more are, are excited, but you've got a lot of kind of energy there. And so you've got paratroopers that are kind of like tapping each other on the head and it's like, hey, have a good jump. I'll see you on the, see you on the drop zone, brother. So it's that kind of attitude that we understand that we put our lives into one another's hands. You know, we are reliant on that, the, uh, the rigor that, that packed that parachute, that he did his job or she did her job and she prepared that parachute for, for operations. We're reliant on the jump master that they're gonna get us out the door safely. We're reliant on the jumper behind me that he's not gonna you know, ride my pack tray. The jumper in front of me is taking the training seriously and he's gonna know what to do if something happens and we collide or something happens in the air. So it's a real sense of, of camaraderie and then when you when you complete the operation, there's, there's a lot of that, you know, the, the, the rank tends to kind of dissolve, we're always professional, but the rank kind of tends to dissolve because, you know, that, first of all, that jump master is in command of that aircraft, regardless of what rank you are. And so we get on the, the drop zone and th there's a real sense of, of teamwork and, and family. And it's, a, it's something I haven't experienced anywhere else in the Army. What does your daughter say to this? She uh, is like me. She is uh, you know, a little afraid of heights. So, <laughs> so, so uh, she, um, you know, she's excited about it. She does not uh, right now want to be a paratrooper, but I'm working on that. <laughs> you have a, a lot of work to do. I have do. a lot of work. Yeah. So. Uh, being a museum and a library, um, we, we have a lot of books, and I'm curious to know if there's a book that you would have that is meaningful to you uh, that you would suggest that our audience, that they should read. Right, so the, the um, Sword of St. Saint Michael is the one that um, is generally referred to as, as lieutenants come into the division, and that is a good one. It captures the full scope of, of World War II. 
and then all the way to Berlin, which I mentioned by uh, James Magellis is another good one. But the Phil Nordyke book, it's a, it's a two volume all the way, um, all American all the way. It's a two volume set about World War II and it really just captures the, the kind of personal first person voice of what happened. It's a lot of quotes. And so to me, what it captures more than some of the other things I've read is the real human fear of, of doing this, not just doing the airborne jumps into Sicily and, and, and some of the other things, but just the real fear of just being the first organization, the first people to train to do this. Um, it was you know, terrifying and that really comes through in the book. And, it, and so that's a, for me, it's a real cool thing to read and a real humanizing thing to read. We have the book here if you want to check it out. Oh, great. Yeah, I, I want to thank you so much hey, thank for you, this sir. conversation. Yeah. Thanks for tuning in to the All American Legacy podcast. We are recording part two of this discussion this week, so stay tuned and be sure to download our other episodes in iTunes, Google Play, or anywhere else you get podcasts.